In Ukraine, Russia says it left Snake Island to ease grain shipments. Kyiv says it drove them out. The NATO summit ends with a formal invitation to Finland and Sweden to join and more backing for Ukraine. Here in the Cube, we'll take a closer look at multiple misleading claims surrounding the NATO summit. And the Jazz Festival in Vienne, France, opens with a French rap star and a big band. Good evening, I'm Chris Burns. Thanks for joining us. Russian forces have withdrawn from Snake Island, a strategic island in the Black Sea, after relentless Ukrainian attacks. The island was taken by Moscow on the first day of the invasion. It sits near an important shipping lane used to export Ukrainian grain to global markets, which Western countries say is now being blocked. In announcing the withdrawal, the Kremlin said it was a, quote, goodwill gesture to allow for more grain exports. But Ukraine's military said they were forced to flee after a barrage of recent artillery and missile strikes. Details have been released on the largest prisoner swap between Moscow and Kiev since the war began. 144 Ukrainian troops were released, according to Kiev's military intelligence. This was in exchange for the same number of Russian soldiers. Many of the Ukrainian troops had serious injuries, such as burns and amputations, with nearly 100 involved in defending the Azovstal steel plant in Mariupol. Russia says it still holds more than 6,000 Ukrainian soldiers. Uh, joining us here to discuss the latest developments uh, is Sasha Vakulina. Sasha, welcome. Um, these a lot of a number of developments today, but uh, you know, first of all, who do we believe about Snake Island? Do the Russians really pull back uh, as a uh, you know a gesture uh, to to allow the grain shipments, or were they kicked out? Well, this is what they say. According to Ukrainian officials, Snake Island has clearly come under very heavy bombardment from Ukraine's counteroffensive and missiles artillery. And now to prove that there is satellite image from the past 24 hours that clearly showed those indications of an assault from the Ukrainian side. There is also an assessment by the Institute for the Study of War that says Ukraine's expulsion of Russian forces from Snake Island is a significant victory for Ukraine as it is a significant loss for Russia. Yeah, that leads, that leads me to that next question is, you know, strategically, what does this all mean in the, in the strategic uh, 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 schema of this, right? This is a very important place so because, of course, this will weaken any plans that Russia had about future attacks on that stretch of the coastline. We are talking southern Ukraine, we are talking the coast of Odessa, Black Sea, and also western Ukraine, because as previously said. So it makes Odessa a bit safer at this point, then? Because a lot of people were yes worried about Odessa. Yes and no. no. Yes and no, because okay. Russia still has huge presence when it comes to Crimea, and these can still be attacked from okay. Crimea. Okay, and then what about this prisoner swap? Um, what was behind this deal? Do we know? Well, interestingly, uh, there was no comment from Moscow about this swap. Mm. Uh, we do know, as you said, 95 of those returned to Ukraine were at Azovstal defenders, but in May there was more than a thousand of Azovstal defenders that were transferred to Russian-held territory, and among them there were two British nationals and one Moroccan national as well. The foreigners were now still held in the breakaway state in eastern Ukraine. Yeah, and they've been, they've been sentenced to death. What's going to happen there? Could there be a prisoner swap there, perhaps? Well, it doesn't look like it for the moment. According to some of the leaders of the breakaway separatist state in the eastern Ukraine, they don't want to do that. That's what they say. Now, of course, there was also the European Court of Human Rights that said it issued an order for Russia to ensure that two Britons captured there will not face the death penalty. But yet again, Moscow does not recognize it. So this is where we stand for the moment. When it comes to how many prisoners of war... Right, how many? Because the Russians are saying 6,000. Is, is that an accurate number? There is no way to verify that yeah. number. We have heard in May from the separatist leaders in eastern Ukraine that we had that over 8,000 in eastern Ukraine. Mm. 8,000 in May, according to separatists in Ukraine. Now, according to Moscow, 6,000. As when it comes to Ukrainian officials, they do not release that information. Sasha, thank you very much. Thank you. NATO leaders are concluding their three-day summit in, this, in Madrid this evening after agreeing a new strategic concept based around a more rapidly deployable uh, force. Leaders pledged more military and financial support for Kyiv, saying that Russia was now the most significant and direct threat to the members' security. Turkey also agreed to drop its veto on Sweden and Finland joining the alliance after a deal was reached on Tuesday. But uh, their accession dis isn't a done deal yet, as our correspondent in Madrid, Efi Kotsukosta, 
explains. The way for Finland and Sweden to finally join NATO won't be that easy. Why? Because following the celebrations, the Turkish president Recep Tayyip Erdogan made things clear, saying that he expects Finland and Sweden to do specific things in order to, to pass uh, the protocol, the accession protocols, and to get it ratified from the Turkish parliament. What does this mean? He said that he expects both countries to keep their promises and what he means, what he, he means when he says promises is to extradite 73 Kurdish mil militants who are considered as terrorists from Ankara. At the same time, Finland and Sweden are expected in Brussels on Tuesday to sign the accession protocols. According to the Finnish foreign minister who spoke to Euronews earlier, the, the whole process is expected to be completed by the end of the year. Now, wrapping up Madrid's summit, uh, NATO's Madrid summit, uh, Jens Stoltenberg, NATO's chief, say, spoke about all the breakthroughs that have been achieved all these three days. And of course, the most significant one is the expansion of the alliance with Finland and Sweden with the invitations of these two countries, these two uh, long neutral Nordic countries, and also the adoption of the strategic concept of the alliance for the next 10 years, the strategic competition of great powers is back and of course uh, the alliance has recognized as the most significant and direct threat for the alliance Russia and it's the first time that the alliance describes the challenges security challenges set by China. Efi Kutsokosta, Madrid, Euronews. Now the NATO summit in Madrid has attracted a lot of international attention on its host country, Spain, but it has also become the focus for online misinformation. Our team in the Cube has been investigating some of the misleading claims. Given all the significant press conferences at this NATO summit in Madrid, it's hardly surprising that, amid all the words, some misinformation has been spreading. Some of these false claims might have tried to sow distrust or tensions amid the alliance but others are simply photos that have been taken out of context. This is one example. This user on Twitter claims that even though Spain is hosting the summit, Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez has apparently been given a sideline role. They claim that at a photo, Pedro Sanchez was positioned in the corner and on the back row. However, this photo is not from this week's summit in Madrid. You can use open source tools to try and find when that photo first appeared online. And as you can see on NATO's official website, it is taken back in March at another NATO summit in Brussels around one month after the Ukraine war began. And indeed, taking a look at so-called family photos from this week's summit, you can see that Pedro Sanchez, Spanish Prime Minister, is indeed positioned on the front row alongside NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. That's one example. However, my colleague Sofia hudson Cover in the Cube has been taking a look at another false claim that concerns Spain's national security. Yes, Matthew, we've been seeing these sorts of tweets all over social media these past few days. In it, they mainly claim that due to the NATO summit, Spain has declared a state of emergency and that there's this new national security law that will prevent anyone from protesting and will even tap into private citizens' communications. However, according to Spanish law, and as you can see on the official website, any state of emergency must be approved by the Congress of Deputies. And then it must be published immediately in the official state gazette and disseminated by all public media. So here in the queue, we check, in the cube, we checked this and we found no trace of such an announcement. And speaking of this new national security law that would prevent people from protesting in the country, well, it simply does not exist. What does exist is an amendment that is due to go before Parliament on the current national security law that takes back from 2015. But this draft does not mention in any way any prohibition of these uh, protesting or tapping into communications. So, Chris, these are just two examples of how online misinformation has spread surrounding the summit in Madrid. Sophia, thank you very much for doing some myth-busting myth there. The G20 chairman is meeting with Moscow in, uh, with the Russian president uh, Vladimir Putin seeking to broker peace talks over Ukraine. The Indonesian president uh, Joko Widodo and Putin also discussed the global food crisis. Widodo has invited Putin to join the next G20 summit in November, despite some other Western leaders saying they'd boycott it if Putin turns up. 
Widodo is on a whistle-stop tour, which saw him at the G7 summit in Germany and a meeting with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. Hardening its media crackdown, Russia's lower house has given its final approval to a bill which will allow the banning of foreign news media. It's in response to other countries' actions against Russian news outlets, and it's expected to be rubber-stamped by the upper house of parliament. The move follows a law made in March which calls for up to 15 years in prison for any report seen as discrediting the Russian military. The Court of Justice of the European Union has ruled against Lithuania on its national law on migrants. Under Lithuania's ruling, those found to have entered the country irregularly can be automatically detained and denied the right to asylum. But the ECJ says this violates EU laws. It has also denied Lithuania's claim it has the right to derogate European law in extraordinary situations. This comes as Poland completed the construction of a steel wall along its border with Belarus following last winter's migrant crisis. Travelers at the UK's busiest airport experienced further disruption today as 30 flights were canceled. Holidaymakers at London's Heathrow Airport were left exasperated as the airport announced the cancellations were due to high passenger numbers. In recent weeks, Heathrow had made the headlines due to severe baggage issues and long queues. Experts say uh, Europe's ongoing aviation woes stem from the COVID-19 pandemic. And coming up, the 3,000-kilometer Tour de France is about to push off, this time starting in Denmark. Stay with us and find out the details. Welcome back to the show. The European Consumer Organization is clamping down on big tech companies who are forcing people to unnecessarily share their personal data. So that means Google is once again in the spotlight and could be fined once again. Uh, Aida Sanchez Alonso has the story. Google is driving European consumers to accept data-invasive options when creating a Google account. That is the claim of the European Consumer Organization, which has published a report accusing the U.S. company of this. According to the European Data Protection Law, companies should offer users the easiest and most protective option by default, what Google is not doing. You are given two options, basically. One is express personalization, one step. The other one is manual personalization, five steps. As a consumer, normally what you want is to go through this process as quickly as possible. You just want to use a certain product or a certain device. I'm going to take one step. If you click on next and then you simply scroll down, click confirm and create your account, you have actually given Google permission to monitor everything you do on Google services and everything you, you do on webs and apps that use Google services. In a coordinated way, 10 European consumer associations presented a complaint against Google. They claim that the language Google uses is unclear, incomplete and misleading. And also that Google's goal is to obtain data from citizens to keep its business growing. Google's business model relies on the collection and exploitation of this data, personal data, for different purposes, namely for targeted advertising purposes, which is uh, the main uh, source of income for, for the company. Now the Irish Data Authority, the country where Google is based in Europe, will deal with the case. So far it has received several fines for privacy issues. In early 2022, Google levied a 150 million euros fine over complications related to refusing cookies. And in 2019, it received a month 50 million euros fine for the way it requested consent from the users. Aida Sanchez Alonso, Euronews Brussels. In sports, last-minute preparations are underway in Copenhagen as the 109th edition of the Tour de France gets underway on Friday on foreign soil. The race, which covers over 3,000 kilometers, will also pass through Belgium and Switzerland as riders make their way to the finish line in Paris. To preview this, we're joined by sports reporter Michael Kern. Uh, Michael, it's that time of year again, um, and uh, we've got a number of people in the competition here. Uh, it's kind of a wide-open thing, isn't it? We've got Slovenian rider uh, Tadej Pogakar in the bookies' favorites to, uh, to claim the yellow jersey, but we've got Welsh uh, veteran uh, Geraint 
uh, Thomas, who comes into the tour after an, a very impressive good performance in the Tour de Suisse. How do you see this now? Well, as you've just listed there, some great names, some great competition. Of course, yeah. uh, Tade there is the two-time defending champion. He won it last year and the year before. Best stage racer on the planet right now, just 23 years old. Um, he's got a great team around him as well. And that's something that's really important with the Tour de France. It's, it's not just about that person who wins the yellow jersey. It's the team around them as well. Um, so yeah. he's got a strong team. And there he's got Rafael uh, Magico alongside him and uh, Brendan McNulty and George Bennett. So certainly a strong effort from the UAE team Emirates. You mentioned, of course, Garrett Thomas, the Ineos Grenadiers, the 2018 winner, of course, Garrett Thomas. Uh, and he's got a great team as well. Danny Martinez uh, and Adam Yates is a former uh, white jersey winner as well. And as you mentioned there, a great performance in the Tour de Suisse for Thomas as well. So certainly a good contender in there. He had a very strong time trial uh, in the Tour de Suisse as well. So plenty of people to keep an eye on. A couple of other names as well worth looking out for uh, will be Ben O'Connor from AGR2 Citroën and Jack Haig, who's part of the Bahrain Victorious team. So plenty to keep our eyes on i'm sure it's going to be entertaining as ever yeah there are lots of people behind you know the, the teams are very important as you say um what about uh, day four and wibbledon uh, some of the giants have fallen how what's uh, what's the situation there what are the big moments so far yeah, Wimbledon. Well, for the Brits yesterday, of course, Raducanu and Andy Murray, they departed the competition. They fell by the wayside. But there's been some positive news today for the Brits. Uh, Katie Bolter, she beat last year's finalist uh, Pishkova in three sets. That was a great battle on centre court a little bit earlier on today. Sitsapas, he's in fine form. He's beat Jordan Thompson in straight sets today. And you may remember just a couple of days ago, uh, Harmony Tan, of course, she knocked out Serena Williams. Uh, she took on Tormo today, won that 6-3, 6 3 6 Four. So she's going on very well in this competition as well. And one of the strong contenders, uh, a new name on the scene in the men's side of the draw, Carlos Alcaraz, uh, another straights victory again for him yesterday. So he's in fine form. Uh, yes, we'll see how Wimbledon plays out. But there could be a fresh name on the trophy this year. We never know. Yeah, that makes it more exciting. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. U.S. President Joe Biden now says he backs putting the right to an abortion in the Constitution. It follows the landmark ruling by the country's Supreme Court that overturned the Roe v. Wade decision that had guaranteed that right. Already, a handful of states have banned abortion, with many more planning to follow suit. Mark Armstrong reports. <laughs> By reversing the landmark Roe v. Wade decision that guaranteed abortion rights across the United States, the Supreme Court has stoked an issue that was already dividing the country. Missouri in the Midwest, for example, has banned abortion, but neighboring Illinois still offers terminations. Lori Lamprich has been driving pregnant women to clinics for two years as a volunteer with the Midwest Access Coalition. MAC provides travel and accommodation to mostly lower-income women seeking the costly procedure. It's just going to get busier. We're just going to have a lot more people. We're going to have all of the folks that would have gone to the Planned Parenthood here in St. Louis that are that are going to be needed to be taken to Illinois. We're going to have folks from maybe mid-Missouri that would have come here to St. Louis that are going to need to go over to Illinois now. Give yourself a chance. More than 46,000 abortions were performed in Illinois in 2020, according to official data, a fifth of them on women from out of state, including 6,500 from Missouri. Planned Parenthood estimates an additional 20,000 to 30,000 people could travel to Illinois every year. It's not really a big victory. Abortion is still available. We just drive around here or there or something like that. But at least it's getting out into the notion that not everybody says this is okay, not everybody agrees with this. Experts are warning that some states might try to prosecute people who help women cross state lines for an abortion. Have mercy on us and on the world. Coming up, legendary French rapper MC Solar opens up the Jazz Fest in Vienne, France. Feast your ears when we come back. Welcome back. Jazz à Vienne. It's a musical festival in the south of France, and it's known for its breathtaking ancient setting that's making its return this week with a special headline act. Mario Bowden can tell us more. One of Europe's oldest jazz festivals returns to the south of France. With its 8,000 capacity Roman amphitheatre, Jazz à Vienne offers an incomparable setting for listening to good music. This year, MC Solart, the French rap legend, got the ball rolling. Euronews' Frédéric Ponsard sat down with him to talk about the rapper's golden era in the 90s. 
C'est une renaissance. Et le fait qu'on soit jazz à Vienne, c'est que... It's a renaissance. And the fact that we're at jazz à Vienne is that in the early 90s, one of my inspirations was jazz. The composers were sampling jazz or mixing jazz. That is to say, rather musical than boom boom. It's a great pleasure to find that again. The fact that we're playing here with a big band, we're about 30 people on stage. Playing these things again, it's extraordinary. A flow that focuses more on the poetics rather than aggression. MC Solar's rap draws from rock, salsa and reggae, bringing together influences from several continents. I call this around the world in 45 seconds. Sometimes we have stories like those of the African griots. There is the power of American music with rap. And we've even brought in France with Serge Gainsbourg, whom we sampled. Music softens people's hearts, and it has no borders. Jazz of Vienne kicks out MC Solo's Europe-wide tour this summer. Mario Bowden, Euronews. Uh, it's great to see MC Solal again. We leave you with a no comment from the Philippines, where protests are continuing in Manila after the son of former dictator Ferdinand Marcos was sworn in as the country's new president. Thanks for watching Euronews tonight. <laughs> Nang makita ito ng mga tao ay ang ganas na pag-ihilong. May iskriba. Sino po yung iskriba? Iskriba ito po yung lagi. Ang Panginoon ay nagbigay lagi ng makatarungan na tuwid.